What did he expect to find? He could not have told anybody, not even himself. What he really expected to find there was the atmosphere. The atmosphere of gratuitous treachery, which, in his view, nothing could excuse. For he thought that even a passion of unrighteousness for its own sake could not excuse that. But could he detect it, sniff it, taste it, receive some mysterious communication which would turn his invincible suspicions into a certitude strong enough to provoke action with all its risks. The master met him on the after deck, looming up in the fog, amongst the blurred shapes of the usual ship's fittings. He was a robust northman, bearded, and in the force of his age, a round leather cap fitted his head closely. His hands were rammed deep into the pockets of his short leather jacket. He kept them there while he explained that at sea he lived in the chart room and led the way there, striding carelessly. Just before reaching the door under the bridge, he staggered a little, recovered himself, flung it open, and stood aside, leaning his shoulder as if involuntarily against the side of the house, and staring vaguely into the fog-filled space, but he followed the commanding officer at once, flung the door to, snapped on the electric light, and hastened to thrust his hands back into his pocket, as though afraid of being seized by them either in friendship or in hostility. The place was stuffy and hot, the usual chart rack overheard was full, and the chart on the table was kept unrolled by an empty cup, standing on a saucer half full of spilt dark liquid. A slightly nibbled biscuit reposed on the chronometer case. There were two settees, and one of them had been made up into a bed with a pillow and some blankets, which were now very much tumbled. The Northman let himself fall on it, his hands still in his pockets. Well, here I am, he said, with a curious air of being surprised at the sound of his own voice. The commanding officer from the other city observed the handsome flushed face. Drops of fog hung on the yellow beard and mustaches of the Northman. The much darker eyebrows ran together in a puzzled frown and suddenly he jumped up. What I mean is that I don't know where I am. I really don't, he burst out with extreme earnestness. Hang it all, I got turned around somehow. The fog has been after me for a week, more than a week, and then my engines broke down. I will tell you how it was. He burst out into loquacity. It was not hurried, but it was insistent. It was not continuous for all that. It was broken by the most queer, thoughtful pauses. Each of these pauses lasted no more than a couple of seconds, and each had the profundity of an endless meditation. When he began again, nothing betrayed in him the slightest consciousness of these intervals. There was the same fixed glance, the same unchanged earnestness of tone, he didn't know. Indeed, more than one of these pauses occurred in the middle of a sentence. The commanding officer listened to the tale. It struck him as more plausible than simple truth is in the habit of being. But that, perhaps, was prejudice. All the time the Northman was speaking, the commanding officer had been aware of an inward voice, a grave murmur in the depth of his very own soul, telling another tale, as if on purpose to keep alive in him his indignation and his anger with that baseness of greed or of mere outlook which lies often at the root of simple ideas. It was the story that had been already told to the boarding officer an hour or so before, the commanding officer nodded slightly at the Northman from time to time. The latter came to an end and turned his eyes away. He added as an afterthought, Wasn't it 
enough to drive a man out of his mind with worry, and it's my first voyage to this part, too, and the ship's my own. Your officer has seen the papers. She isn't much, as you can see for yourself, just an old cargo boat, bare living for my family. He raised a big arm to point at a row of photographs plastering the bulkhead. The movement was ponderous, as if the arm had been made of lead. The commanding officer said carelessly, You'll be making a fortune yet for your family with this old ship. Yes, if I don't lose her, said the Northman gloomily. I mean, out of this war, added the commanding officer. The Northman stared at him in a curiously unseeing and at the same time interested manner, as only eyes of a particular blue shade can stare. And you wouldn't be angry at it, he said, would you? You are too much of a gentleman. We didn't bring this on you, and suppose we sat down and cried. What good would that be? Let those cry who made the trouble, he concluded, with energy. Time's money, you say. Well, this time is money. Oh, isn't it? The commanding officer tried to keep under the feeling of immense disgust. He said to himself that it was unreasonable. Men were like that. Moral cannibals feeding on each other's misfortunes. He said aloud, You have made it perfectly plain how it is that you are here. Your logbook confirms you very minutely. Of course, a logbook may be cooked. Nothing easier. The Northman never moved a muscle. He was gazing at the floor. He seemed not to have heard. He raised his head after a while. But you can't suspect me of anything, he muttered negligently. The commanding officer thought, why should he say this? Immediately afterwards, the man before him added, my cargo is for an English port. His voice had turned husky for the moment. The commanding officer reflected, that's true, there can be nothing. I can't suspect him. Yet, why was he lying with steam up in this fog? And then, hearing us come in, why didn't he give some sign of life? Why? Could it be anything else but a guilty conscience? He couldn't tell by the leadsman that this was a man of war. Yes, why? The commanding officer went on thinking. Suppose I ask him and then watch his face. He will betray himself in some way. It's perfectly plain that this fellow has been drinking. Yes, he has been drinking, but he will have a lie ready all the same. The commanding officer was one of those men who are made morally and almost physically uncomfortable by the mere thought of having to beat down a lie. He shrank from the act in scorn and disgust, which were invincible because more temperamental than moral. So he went out on deck instead, and had the crew mustered formally for his inspection. He found them very much what the report of the boarding officer had led him to expect, and from their answers to his questions he could discover no flaw in the logbook story. He dismissed them. His impression of them was a picked lot, having been promised a fistful of money each if this came off, all slightly anxious but not frightened. Not a single one of them likely to give the show away. They don't feel in danger of their life. They know England and English ways too well. He felt alarmed at catching himself thinking as if his vaguest suspicions were turning into a certitude, for indeed there was no shadow of reason for his inferences. There was nothing to give away. He returned to the chart room. The Northman had lingered behind there, and something subtly different in his bearing, more bold in his blue, glassy stare, induced the commanding officer to conclude that the fellow had snatched at the opportunity to take another swig at the bottle he must have had concealed somewhere. 
He noticed, too, that the Northman, on meeting his eyes, put on an elaborately surprised expression. At least it seemed elaborated. Nothing could be trusted, and the Englishman felt himself with astonishing conviction faced by an enormous lie, solid like a wall, with no way round to get at the truth, whose ugly murderous face he seemed to see peeping over at him with a cynical grin. I dare say, he began suddenly, you are wondering at my proceedings, though I am not detaining you, am I? You wouldn't dare to move in this fog. I don't know where I am, the Northman ejaculated earnestly. I really don't. He looked around as if the very chart room fittings were strange to him. The commanding officer asked him whether he had not seen any unusual objects floating about while he was at sea. Objects? What objects? I don't need those thinking objects. We had a few clear intervals, said the commanding officer, and I'll tell you what, we have seen and the conclusion I've come to about it. He told him in a few words. He heard the sound of a sharp breath indrawn through closed teeth. The Northman, with his hand on the table, stood absolutely motionless and dumb. He stood as if thunderstruck. Then he produced a fatuous smile. Or at least so it appeared to the commanding officer. Was this significant or of no meaning whatever? He didn't know. He couldn't tell. All the truth had departed out of the world as if drawn in, absorbed in this monstrous villainy this man was, or was not, guilty of. Shooting's too good for people that conceive neutrality in this pretty way, remarked the commanding officer after a silence. Yes, 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 the Northman assented hurriedly, then added an unexpected and dreamy voiced perhaps. Was he pretending to be drunk, or only trying to appear sober? His glance was straight, but it was somewhat glazed. His lips outlined themselves firmly under his yellow mustache, but they twitched. Did they twitch? And why was he drooping like this in his attitude? There's no perhaps about it, pronounced the commanding officer sternly. The Northman had straightened himself, and unexpectedly he looked stern too. No, but what about the tempters? Better kill that lot off. There's about four, five, six million of them, he said grimly, but in a moment changed into a whining key. But I had better hold my tongue. You have some suspicions. No, I have no suspicions, declared the commanding officer. He never faltered. At that moment, he had the certitude. The air of the chart room was thick with guilt and falsehood, braving the discovery defying simple right, common decency, all humanity of feeling, every scruple of conduct. The Northman drew a long breath. Well, we know that you English are gentlemen, but let us speak the truth. Why should we love you so very much? You haven't done anything to be loved. You don't love the other people, of course. They haven't done anything for that either. A fellow comes along with a bag of gold. I haven't been in Rotterdam my last voyage for nothing. You may be able to tell something interesting then to our people when you come into port, interjected the officer. I might, but you keep some people in your pay at Rotterdam. Let them report. I am a neutral. Am I not? Have you ever seen a poor man on one side and a bag of gold on the other. Of course, I couldn't be tempted. I haven't the nerve for it. Really, I haven't. It's nothing to me. I am just talking openly for once. Yes, and I am listening to you, said the commanding officer quietly. The Northman leaned forward over the table. Now that I know you have no suspicions, I talk. You don't know what a poor man is. I do. I am poor myself. This old ship, 
she isn't much, and she is mortgaged to bare living, no more. Of course, I wouldn't have the nerve, but a man who has nerve, see, the stuff he takes aboard looks like any other cargo. Packages, barrels, tins, copper tubes, whatnot. He doesn't see it work. It isn't real to him. But he sees the gold. That's real. Of course, nothing could induce me. I suffer from an internal disease. I would either go crazy from anxiety or, or take to drinking or something. The risk is too great. Why, ruin. It should be death, the commanding officer got up after this curt declaration, which the other received with a hard stare, oddly combined with an uncertain smile. The officer's gorge rose at the atmosphere of murderous complicity which surrounded him, denser, more impenetrable, more acrid than the fog outside. It's nothing to me, murmured the Northman, swaying visibly. Of course not, assented the commanding officer, with a great effort to keep his voice calm and low. The certitude was strong within him, but I am going to clear all you fellows off this coast at once, and I will begin with you. You must leave in half an hour. By that time, the officer was walking along the deck with a northman at his elbow. What, in this fog? The latter cried out huskily. Yes, you will have to go in this fog. But I don't know where I am. I really don't. The commanding officer turned round. A sort of fury possessed him. The eyes of the two men met. Those of the northmen expressed a profound amazement. Oh, you don't know how to get out, the commanding officer spoke with composure, but his heart was beating with anger and dread. I will give you your course. Steer south by east, half east, for about four miles, and then you will be clear to haul to the eastward for your port. The weather will clear up before very long. And yet you must go, unless you want to. I don't want to, panted the northman. I've enough of it. The commanding officer got over the side. The northman remained still, as if rooted to the deck. Before his boat reached his ship, the commanding officer heard the steamer beginning to pick up her anchor. Then, shadowy in the fog, she steamed out on the given course. He had said to his officers, I let him go. The narrator bent forward towards the couch where no movement betrayed the presence of a living person. Listen, he said forcibly, that course would lead the Northmen straight on a deadly ledge of rock, and the commanding officer gave it to him. He steamed out, ran on it, and went down. So he had spoken the truth. He did not know where he was, but it proves nothing, nothing either way. It may have been the only truth in all of this story, and yet he seems to have been driven out by a menacing stare, nothing more. He abandoned all pretense. Yes, I gave that course to him. It seemed to me a supreme test. I believe, no, I don't believe, I don't know. At the time I was certain. They all went down, and I don't know whether I have done stern retribution or murder, whether I have added to the corpses that litter the bed of the unreadable sea, the bodies of men completely innocent or basely guilty. I don't know. I shall never know. He rose. The woman on the couch got up and threw her arms round his neck. Her eyes put two gleams in the deep shadow of the room. She knew his passion for truth, his horror of deceit, his humanity. Oh, my poor, poor. I shall never know, he repeated sternly, disengaged himself, pressed her hands to his lips, and went out.